radical transparency is up there with radical ownership. It's it's just it's owning it's owning mistakes. It's it's owning sometimes why we're doing what we're doing. It's it's really just it's honesty. It's not you know it's not realistic that um, the people that work within an organization can know every single thing about how it runs. But I think that I think often there's more that they could and should know than is maybe typical in in organizations. And and I think that's part of it. Just just being authentic and honest and owning mistakes, even as leaders, this, um, or especially, especially as leaders. I mean, we make, Megan and I make mistakes all the time, but our, our team knows that we are, we attribute our growth to our mistakes and learning from our mistakes and, and we own them. And sometimes they're really big, but I think it's really important to just be human and own up to what did or didn't work and then move on from it. Welcome to Growth Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Today we look at leadership. Really, what does it take to create a place where people feel like owners? I have done this work. I have spoken on stages about ownership. It is such a critical factor if you want to create a culture of high performance people that are self-managing. This culture of people that are self-managing really is about them taking ownership of their work, of the client experience, of the goals in front of them, and working together as a team as they take ownership. Now, is this easy? No, it's not easy. I'm not gonna tell you that there's a, a, a one, two, three step behind this. There's a lot of factors that go into how someone feels while they're at work. This employee experience is a real thing. Leaders must tune into what that employee experience is. And that sense of ownership is a very powerful force inside of any business that's growing fast. Today's special guest is Fried Markroff. They were in the ink list for a fast growth company. They have 14 employees, but don't let that fool you because they've really worked hard on creating a place where people feel like owners. We're sitting down with Megan Fried and Kristen Markroff to really understand how they see the sense of ownership inside the company. When we talk about all the different factors here, you can learn from all the different stages of the research that I've done in my research to help you figure out where you are. I'm not gonna go through them with you today because I want you to actually take an active role in doing this. If you're listening to this on the run, in the car, you might wanna pause it, you might wanna take some notes around what we're doing and I'm walking them through those six factors. Now, there's other ways to get this, of course, on my podcast, but this interview will help you put it in context of why they're growing so fast, why they're so lit up as leaders of these people and why there's a connection there that a lot of companies just don't have. So this interview will help you be a better leader, help you create a culture of ownership. And if you have any questions about what your next step is, make sure you reach out to me, genehammett.com. I'm here to help you to be an extraordinary leader so that you can be the best leader that you can be. Just go to genehammett.com to find more details. Now here's the interview with Megan and Kristen. Hi, how are you? Great, Hi. how are you doing today, Jean? Excited to have you and Megan and Kristen here. Thanks so much, we're happy, we're we're happy, happy to be here. here. <laughs> you're like twins answering together. <laughs> Megan, you're the Very. blonde, right? <laughs> Megan's the blonde, yeah. Kristen's right. the brunette. Kristen, fantastic. Well, we're here to talk about leadership and culture and growth and all those things, but your company has been honored by the Inc. 5000. Tell us a little bit about Fried Markroff. Uh, we are a family law firm in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, we founded our firm in um, 2012, July 2012, so we're actually coming up on a, a, an anniversary. Um, we started our firm as a general practice, uh, as a lot of firms do. Um, we like to call it door law, where you take everything that walks in the door because you don't feel like you're in a place to turn down um, an opportunity to uh, make money. And then uh, pretty, pretty quickly into our firm, we decided to narrow our specialty um, into family law and try to figure out a way to just get really good at one thing. Um, and that's what we've been doing uh, since probably 2014. And that was the step that we took that led to yeah. the growth. Uh, to the growth. Right. So I think last year was our second year on the Inc. In in 5000. So those things, if we had to pick one thing to tie it back yeah. to, it is it's focusing yeah. and making sure that we were awesome 
at one yeah. thing rather than rather than just trying to do everything and not really getting great at any of those things. You know, lawyers typically get it, but you had to go through that journey of discovery for yourself. Right. I went through it as a coach when I first started. I was coaching anybody who had a, a problem and, right. and whatnot. And, <laughs> right. I mean, no shortage of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was ridiculous. I charged 50 bucks an hour and it, it finally dawned on me, who's going to trust a business coach at $50 an hour? Right. I didn't have the confidence in what I was doing at, you know, this was 11 years ago. So fast forward to today, it's much different. I'm much more focused. I work with fast growth companies, just like yourself. And I'm really curious about what makes them fast growth companies. Now you wouldn't be where you are today and able to, to do it as carefree as you do if you didn't have people around you supporting you. So tell us a little bit about your team and how that, um, how you describe your team. Yeah. So, um, well, back when we started in 2012, um, the whole team would be in this, in this frame, right? Yeah. This was the team. Um, and so it became clear that we needed to expand. And there's been a lot of evolution of, of Kristen and myself as leaders. I, I think that we, we realized about, we had a team before we had really invested in this developing the skills yeah. to lead that team right and so um the team we have now we really see as our client yes. so Kristen and Megan's main clients are our team and Fried Marcroft's clients are the team's client that's kind of the the structure of how we we view it now. and that I mean in that philosophically, I think we are always there, but I don't think we were necessarily practicing that particularly well. Right. And, you know, like so many other um, companies, the, the, the pandemic really forced us to get serious about not just managing our team, but, but really taking care of our team and recognizing, like Megan said, that they are our clients. And if we put all our energy into taking care of the firm's clients, and the, the, the people that work in that firm are, are breaking down or you know, not able to do the work that we need them to do, then, then what's the point of any of it? And the, we, we really took the pandemic as an opportunity to, to really drill down on that. And it wasn't necessarily like big fancy things. Sometimes it was just really paying attention to how they were doing. I mean, it, as simple as a text message, like, are you okay? And, uh, you know, beyond, we went remote pretty quickly. So more than just, you know, what's your work from home setup look like? Do you need a monitor? Do you need a chair? It turned into just paying attention to things that they were saying. And then Megan and I having conversations like, I think that, and we have a lot of, um, in, on our team, which is uh, right now it's all women. And we have, we have moms among those women. And we were, you know, hearing stress in people's voices about the other kids are working or uh, schooling from home and they're working from home and just paying attention to those things. And just something like a simple thing, like let's send dinner. Mm. And the little things like that really added up to, you know, we talked about, um, we've talked about ownership in the past with Eugene, really added up to their feeling ownership because we are all sort of pulling towards this thing together and going through a thing together and not just worried about our clients taken care of. I think just really creating an environment where we were really trying hard to recognize that these are people with lives going through this thing that we are all going through and trying to do little things here and there that just were signals like we care. But if we hadn't the two years prior, yeah gotten really serious about our roles as leaders, yes. we wouldn't have been able to, to do that through the pandemic. So it's almost like we realized about two years ago that we needed to spend a lot of time investing in, in studying, right? Yeah. Studying and practicing leadership and creating a real naming our culture. Yeah. Right. And, and cause you have a culture, even if you don't name it right in the absence of something, there is still something. But when we named it and started hiring for culture and started leading with culture, instead of our old leadership style was much more ad hoc, I think yeah. than it is now, then, then we were really able during the pandemic, the pandemic was a test of our role as leaders of a team rather than leaders of a business. Yeah. But when we're, Let me jump in here. Yeah. I'm going to ask you guys, because you, you, there was a lot there to unpack, and we'll probably yeah. spend the rest of the episode unpacking just that opening statement. One of the things you said really in the beginning of this, I think, Megan, you said this about, we just started doing little things. Yeah. And I've, I've kind of joked that leadership really doesn't cost much money. 
It's not about paying people, you know, tons of money and whatnot. It's about how you make them feel a simple text, uh, an appreciation, or just checking in to see how things are going. Tell us just a little bit about how your behaviors has changed as you evolved as a leader. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's exactly what you said. And it's, so it's listening, it's hearing things that people are just offhand or, or, uh, you know, a tone in their voice. I mean, you can hear when, when somebody is, you know, upset or stressed out and they could still be doing their job. You know, we have, we have daily calls with our whole team and you can hear things. Part, the, the purpose of those calls, yes, to, is to sort of set the, set the, the goals for, for the, the day, day and the tone for the day, but it's also an opportunity in 15 minutes to kind of check in with everybody. And I don't mean check in like, how are you? How are you? How are you? But listening to the, what people's voices sound like, and then, and then, but, but not just listening, then doing something about it. I mean, so often Megan and I hang, hang up from those calls and we'll, you know, so-and-so sound a little bit off today. And then, yeah, a check-in, a text, what's going on? I mean, a couple of weeks ago, as simple as one of our um, you know, key employees, she just mentioned like, I got to mow my lawn and, and she's a, a single mom. And, and for us, like a real linchpin in our organization, we just sent a guy. Right. So it's like, I mean, it's just simple things like that. It's almost like what we had been doing was understanding that our clients were human right and forgetting on a certain level that the people that take care of our clients are human right right? and so we started to think about that in a really intentional way and then during the pandemic humans obviously had more day-to-day complications in their lives not the least of which being homeschooling children, right? Um, that than we did. So we were in a position where we could really invest in being humans, caring about the humans that work for us, who take care of our human clients who are going through the divorce transition. Now hold on for a second. One of them just mentioned the importance of tone of voice and listening. Now I'm going to zero in on this because if you want someone to feel connected to the work, you want to be able to tune into what's going on beyond the words. So they may say something, but their tone of voice matters. Just like when your spouse barks at you and you're like, oh, did I deserve that or not? You know something's wrong. Maybe maybe she or he's on edge. When you think about it, your employees, are you listening for that tone of voice? Are you asking questions to help you understand what's going on there? Maybe you need to back up a second and just ask, hey, is there something going on that you need to tell me about? I know that sounds like a weird conversation to ask in a workplace, but you want people to know that you care. You really do want to tune into what's going on. Maybe you can help them with something small, or maybe just listening to them for a moment is what they need. Now back to the interview. So you have mentioned this, and I want to go back to something you said earlier and just put a spotlight on it just for a moment. I ask what I call the impossible question. I can't remember if I've asked you this before. But I'm I think so. now I'm nervous. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> so, studying fast growth companies, I'm always looking for the patterns behind what makes them run fast. And, mm-hmm. and really, it's not just about their marketing or sales strategy. It's about leadership and about culture. And I, I found this question that really unlocks the perspective that I think you guys are describing. And I go, as a fast growth leader, what's more important, your customers or clients mm-hmm. or employees? Employees. And... I have to ask why, because the people listening in here have heard for many, many times, it's not employees, it's clients or it's stakeholders, you know, through the seventies and eighties, it was always stakeholders, right? Right. Whoever whoever has the shares, that's who you serve, but you said employees. So why is it employees to you guys? So for me, um, at the, at the first, in the first round of our growth, right? Sort of that like initial rocket, right? At that point, it was clients, 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 yeah. clients, clients. And if we didn't make the pivot to understanding our, that for us, the team is our client and for our team, the clients are their clients. If we didn't make that pivot, we would have hit, hit a wall, dra- mm-hmm. like off the edge of a cliff. I don't even think we'd, we'd be here with the business to talk about. I agree. You just can't, you can't scale without I hate the term human resources, right? But in this sense, it's like the, the, our most important resources are our staff. Yeah. I, I just don't think you can help exactly the number of people that you, that these two people can help really, really well. Mm-hmm. That would be the exact size right. of our company. Right. That's it. Right. Those are the, and, and for us, it's like, we want to help as many people as we can have the best possible divorce 
and the two of us doing it just can't help that many people. And then bigger than that, for both for Megan and definitely for me as well, uh, I, it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding really taking the time and the resources to invest in people that work with us and see and, and, and participate and watch their growth. And that's, that's what really gets me out of bed in the morning. I love that we have a firm whose entire mis- mission is to help people. And so often for me, those people are our, our staff and it's just, it's imminently rewarding. And then, you know, it just trickles down because if, if they're, if the people that work with us are feeling great about who they are and what they do, that they, they can only benefit our clients. And then, yeah, at the end of the day, the bottom line, a hundred percent. I'm going to play a little bit of a, a- kind of a rapid fire questions with you guys, because I want you guys to be able to weigh in on all of the areas. There's six different areas that I've mapped out on this idea of people feeling like owners. And just to to frame it all in here, when a company is being run by leaders that inspire people to feel like owners, even if they don't have a financial stake, Mm -hmm. meaning options and and profit sharing and all that stuff, those, those tools are great, but they can feel a sense of ownership in their work and serving the client's you agree with me on this. So 100%, um, yes. in a rapid fire standpoint, one or two sentences on this, why is mission a part of that formula of ownership? I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, human beings are, are at their best when they have a purpose. I mean, and that to me is what a mission is. And if you get buy-in on what that looks like, then there, I, I think the people that work with you are inspired to be moving towards that mission together. Whereas, as opposed to dictating, this is what we're doing and why we're doing it. If you get buy-in on it, there, it's just, it's more, it's more likely that we're all going to be driving towards that mission. Now, I want to take the second one. And I actually had this conversation with a group today on inclusion. Why is inclusion mm-hmm. an important piece of feeling like owners? Oh, that's like, we were just yeah, talking just about talking this about before we came on. So what we did um, for our firm retreat this time is we decided to- Just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, we decided, because we, we were able to physically be together, we decided to take apart our legal process and rebuild it, right? And we put everyone in the room because we wanted to make sure that the in, interplay of the technical things, legal strategy, settlement strategy, trial strategy, was getting input from the folks that do the billing, that answer the phone, that help do our, our sales and marketing. Yep. So because the client experience impacts, is so impacted along the process, everyone had something to add. And now we know with when we have this rebuilt process, everyone's best ideas are in it, mm-hmm. but also everyone owns a piece yeah. of it because we built it together. Right. And we got there quicker than we would have. Um, quicker and better than if Megan and I had just tried to do it together, or if if all we had included was our legal team. We just, we have, we have such a better outcome because we brought everybody together in a room for a day and took apart something and put it back together, together. So now I want to ask you about empowerment, Mm -hmm. which is kind of that opposite of micromanagement. Why is that an important piece to ownership? That's the whole show, right? I mean, (laughs) we, we, we have a large investment in each of the members of our team and we want them to be here for the long haul if that's what fits with their goals and our business's goals right we we hire to make sure we're going to march together for a long time Mm -hmm. and i think that that investment is the way you connect people to the mission and keep on the mission And I think creating uh, creating a culture of a culture of good ideas right. and not caring where they come from, just that we're that we care about good ideas and it really the best ideas. What's a better way to do something that we've always been doing? What's a better way to do something completely different than we've ever been doing that will better our mission? And creating a culture of not caring who who had the best idea, so people are empowered to share their ideas and not you know. It's how you don't miss out on stuff. If, if we, if it was just this culture of the ideas are Megan and Kristen's and it's everybody else's job to implement the ideas. I, again, I think that's another um, instance of we might not be sitting here with you. Well, especially since like the bigger you get, the you're not as close to every function as you were at the beginning. And it's almost like 
it's finding the opportunity in any problem, which we've all we've all heard that. But in practice, our best ideas have come from this didn't go well. How can we yeah. make it better? What is there to learn about it? And that culture of being of having people have that mindset to look for like great. How do we do this better next time? Is really like how we it's how we keep improving. Now hold on. They mentioned the importance of investing in your people. I do a lot of leadership feedback scores where I help people understand how they're showing up as a leader and get feedback from those around them, the 360 feedback kind of thing. And one of the areas that really comes up a lot often in small companies is that people want to feel a sense of personal development. They want to get training. They want skills. They want anything that will help them be a better person, be a better leader, be a better tactician, financial analyst, whatever it may be. But you want to make sure that you're taking the time to invest in your people and really be intentional about how they're growing under your charge. If you do that, then they'll show up a little bit more eager, a little bit more engaged in the work they're doing and service your customers and clients to the highest level possible because they know that they're in a place that's taking care of them. Just my two cents and what I've seen across many companies, there's a missing element of really investing in people. Back to the interview. You guys must have seen one of my speeches before, or videos or something, because the, the words you're dropping in here makes you think that, I, that you've been watching me. Um, specifically, I have this whole moment inside of speeches where I talk about not that the best ideas should win. Yeah, right. If, if it's your ideas as the founder of the company that says this is the way direction we're going, mm -hmm. you can only go so far. But when right. you truly have people that feel a sense of empowerment around those ideas yes. and connected to it, and you're allowing those voices to come out, they have a sense of ownership. Um, so right. uh, I know you haven't been spying on me, but I just thought I'd bring that up. <laughs> well, you're We've not spying a little. <laughs> the, the, the other element behind it that you mixed in there, so we don't have to ask a question on it, but I'll just just kind of mention it is growth mm -hmm. is in order for employees to have that sense of ownership, they've got to know that their skills are going from one level to the next. They, yeah. When they show up yeah. to work, what their experiences, they've got to be connected to, to their own value increase. Right. Not right. because they're looking for another job, they just want to grow. Right. And when you offer that to them, you have mm -hmm. that, that sense of ownership. Yeah. There's one in here that you haven't mentioned, but I, I, I have a sneaky opinion that is probably yeah. right there on the tip of your tongue. Everyone I've seen that has a sense of ownership believes in transparency. 100%, oh, yes. yes. Why radical. is transparency radical? radical. Yeah. Like, so give me an idea of what radical transparency means to you guys. I think radical transparency is up there with radical ownership. It's, it's just, it's owning, it's owning mistakes. It's, it's owning sometimes why we're doing what we're doing. It's, it's really just, it's honesty. It's not, you know, it's not realistic that um, the people that work within an organization can know every single thing about how it runs. But I think that, I think often there's more that they could and should know than is maybe typical in, in organizations. And, and I think that's part of it. Just, just being authentic and honest and owning mistakes, even as leaders, this, um, or especially, as leaders. especially as leaders. I mean, we make, Megan and I make mistakes all the time, but our, our team knows that we are, we attribute our growth to our mistakes and learning from our mistakes and, and we own them. And sometimes they're really big, but I think it's really important to just be human and own up to what did or didn't work and then move on from it. Love all that. Now, the, the last one you've actually mentioned before, and it comes down to the mindset of ownership. And the way I describe this with clients and, and whenever I'm working in workshops, I said, there's two sides to this. Leaders have to be willing to give mm -hmm. and employees have to be willing to receive yeah. because if, if the employee doesn't want to want to, re you know, uh, receive a sense of ownership on this project, it never happens. Right. Okay. No. It takes both sides. Tell me just a little bit about, you know, that mindset that you guys see. for ownership. <laughs> I tell this story um, about myself when I was an employee rather than an owner, where I thought that my boss didn't remember if I didn't get the project done that I didn't think made lot, a lot of sense, right? There's always one of those. And now as a boss, we say to people like, look, we just remember. <laughs> I, I now know my boss remembered every project yeah. that I sort of was like, if I don't do that, maybe that thing will go away, right? And what we're encouraging them to say is, why is it the thing right. that you're not into? Yeah. Right? Are you not the right person to do it? Is it a dumb idea? What am I missing? Right? And I think that my lesson from 
and sometimes it's just, I'm too over, I, I'm overwhelmed, right? But my lesson from being an employee is the lesson I've converted into being a leader to just be candid with people about the fact that like, hey, we may not always say everything, but we always remember. Yeah. <laughs> so we went through six core principles of ownership. This will be what my book is, is about. And, and maybe there's something you feel like I've left out. What would you say really contributes to people feeling a sense of ownership across the company? I think giving, I think giving real opportunities to participate in, uh, in, in change. I mean, we, we mentioned our firm retreat. That was a really big deal. I mean, we were, we do firm retreats all the time. We haven't over the past year, but they've always been something kind of more like sexier, like personal growth. We've brought speakers in, we've done really awesome workshops and, and Megan and I knew what we needed to do with our, with our legal system. And we, we're going to try to do it ourselves. And then just legal team. And they were like, no, the whole team. And then we kept selling it with, we're going to a baseball game after, like, it's going to be a long day, but we're going to a baseball game after we didn't give credit. I couldn't believe how excited they all were. They came yeah. with notes. They came with ideas. They came prepared and we accomplished so much, so much quicker than I, than either of us thought we were going to be able to. And my takeaway from that is they were always there willing to do those things that nothing, they didn't need a baseball game. I mean, that was cool. But at the end of the day, they were psyched to be asked to participate in, in building something really important. And I, I'm never going to make that mistake again. Like I know now that that's, I, I should, I, I'm going forward and going to assume that rather than be surprised by it. One more thing that I would add is that with our values, with our core values, one of them is radical ownership. Mm -hmm. And we do a weekly values award to make sure that, that our, our values aren't like something that gets put on a laminated board and stuck up on a wall somewhere and, you know, which is the equivalent of in a desk drawer. Yep. We, um, we have a, a weekly contest for the person that most exemplifies the firm's core values and given by the members of the team. And then they pick what value. And if we had to get to one, this is my core value, yeah. right? I because see. you have to, you have to take ownership or we're never going to move forward. We're never going to be as we, as good as we could be. And I think that making it, baking it into our actual values is really, really critical. Name it and then expect 100% ownership and accountability of mm -hmm. everything that we all do every day. It's not easy, but you, you get better with practice. Yeah. I know I'm so close to my message. I appreciate you guys going through what I'm missing, but it's actually included in those others. I, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you guys have really been, uh, you know, brought a lot of energy and clarity around this conversation of employees taking ownership. You've grown a fast growth company. You should really be honored around that. You've worked hard on yourselves. The reason I come here to tell stories like this is because I want you guys to be able to to, to share this message out there for others to learn about what does it look like to be great leaders. It's not always comfortable. It's not always <laughs> easy. No. <laughs> and it takes a lot of intention to yeah. become the kind of leaders that you guys have become. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. This we was pretty great. It. Thanks so much, Jean. Thank you so much. So I'm wrapping up what I took away from today's interview with these guys. And it's incredible to be in front of a lot of leaders like this. I had a chance to sit down with 22 founders and CEOs just last Friday, where we talked about not being the bottleneck of your business. Well, wow. one of the solutions behind that is to really give ownership um, mm -hmm. in, in a really powerful way. But we talked about some really serious things. and. Here's what I've learned from this conversation is everyone is in this journey of leadership and they're trying to figure out how they fit in, how they connect with people. Everyone's individual. All businesses are a little bit different. And so if you're kind of curious about where you are, what your next steps are, make sure you check out some of the free content we have at my website, Gene Hammett. If you want to join the community we have of other fast growth leaders and you think you want to evolve as a leader, be extraordinary, then check out Fast Growth Boardroom. If you think you apply, go ahead and put an application. I'm here to support you to be the best leader you can be. Your team deserves it. Thanks for being here, listening to Growth Think Tank. As always, we with courage. We'll see you next time.